everybody. About that time, so we'll go ahead and get started. First of all, let me say good to see you tonight. Glad you're here. And uh, hope you've had a good day. Weather's been beautiful. Got Ginger up here on the front row. Yeah. You've never seen it up here, have you? Well, I don't know. Sunday morning, you're pretty close. I mean, you're not too far. You don't usually sit up here. <laughs> uh, anyway, wherever you're seated, we're glad you're here. And uh, if you're watching online, uh, we welcome you as well. Hi, Laura. You're in charge of these three right here. I know you can't handle that one or that one. That one, maybe. <laughs> Uh, okay. The big announcement uh, for the evening centers around something called Community Share Day. PK, you gonna cover that later? <laughs> well. I was going to get somebody else to do it, but they're not here yet. But in the back, on the table, where PK is now standing, there are some flyers like this that advertises the share day. And uh, we've been talking about the various items that you can donate and when you can donate and where you donate. The actual share day is uh, May the 6th from 9 to 1 at the J.C. Barn. And it is sponsored by several of our community churches. We are one of those. And uh, if you have not brought your goods uh, to the trailer or to the J.C. Barn, uh, you need to do that because time is rapidly slipping away. So uh, make a note of that. And I think the information is also in our newsletter. So you can go there as a source of information as well. So with that said, any other announcements? Okay, let's go to our prayer sheet, if you will. And looking at the church family, uh, we have a number of folks that uh, have some tests and procedures coming up. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, Joe Fisher had a heart ablation today. Uh, I don't have any report on him. Does anyone, has anyone heard from Joe? Oh, uh, I have. He, okay. The procedure took four hours, and it's going to keep him two more hours before they let him come home. Now, I don't know if he's home yet or not. Okay. But they did. The procedure was helpful. Successful. Yes. That's good. Seems like a long time, but hey, whatever it takes to make it right. So, now that's the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Al and Glenn, for that update. <laughs> Do pray for Joe, for Catherine, uh, during this time as he uh, recovers from that procedure. Uh, yes. My mama is not having surgery on May 19th. She's going to the doctor to see the day she <coughs> Okay. Shirley Wright is not having back surgery on the 19th. She merely goes to the doctor to, to get it scheduled. So make that change on your prayer sheet. But don't mark her off. Pray for her. Uh, if you've ever had any back problems at all, I mean, even if it just hurt for a minute, you know that's not a lot of fun. So do pray for her. <laughs> any other updates on any of those? <coughs> okay, let's move to our uh, other names that are listed on our, our sheet here. And I wonder if any of you have updates on any of those uh, that are listed. Uh, you will see Butch and Martha Ann in the middle column there up near the top. 
Uh, and if you stick your head in the kitchen, you will see both those two, which means they're doing better. But continue to pray for them uh, in the, the days ahead. Any other updates that you would share with us? Okay. Under our church or under the extended family, uh, you'll see the names that we have listed there. And Sherry, do we have a, a date on her surgery? She actually had it Tuesday. Tuesday. She's doing great, so we take her off the list. Okay, so she did good from the surgery. She Is she up and walking now? Yes. Well, they don't, they don't mess around. No. You it's come out. Yeah. Outpatient. Well, soon it's just going to be drive through, you know. <laughs> Prop your feet up here on the dashboard. <laughs> Glad she's doing well. Uh, sympathy to the uh, Grantham family. Pray for them. And other names that are listed. Any updates on any of those? Okay. Y'all know as much as I do. <laughs> That's what happens when you've been gone for three days. On the back side, we have our uh, residents in the various care facilities around the area. And so continue to pray for them, as well as uh, our special prayer needs, which you see there. And also in that column, especially down at the bottom, uh, you will see two things to highlight. One is our little uh, light preschool is continuing to evolve and our vacation Bible school coming up the first week in June. So please pray for those. And if you are available during that first week of June to help with vacation Bible school, I'm sure if you see Pebbles Pittman, she'll sign you right up. Pray for our missionaries those uh, on the international fields, those in North America, as well as our, our state missionaries. Uh, pray for our expectant parents, especially uh, with Seth and Elizabeth Peavy. Uh, by now, most of you have heard about that situation, so please pray for them. Any other additions to our prayer list that we need to mention before we pray? Y'all are a very quiet group tonight. can be frightening. Ben, make a note of that. I do want to say that um, Doris Pilgrim, who's at home. Yes, ma'am. She is in Bloomfield right now. She failed uh, last week, and she needs to get her arm and she needs to get her arm. And they cannot do surgery on her because of her age. And so she's just in a lot of pain. Okay, she's in swing bed for the time being. But when she finishes swing bed, she'll move back over to at home. Okay. okay. That's Doris Killebrew, for those of you who did not hear, J.D. Wright's sister. Anything we need to add? All right, let's pray, and uh, then PK will come and share with us from... Uh, Exodus, moving us further along. Was it chapter 32 he did? I don't know, whatever chapter he was on last week. It was verse 1. Oh, yeah, we got in. Yeah, he got one verse done. We'll do verse 2 tonight, probably. Okay, let's pray. Father, tonight we come and acknowledge that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the creator of this universe. We are the created. You are worthy of worship, of adoration, and praise. You have created us out of the dust of the earth, and you breathed into us the breath of life. No other creature can claim that. 
And so for that, we give thanks. And we thank you for the privilege, for the opportunity that is ours to have a personal and intimate relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. If we put our faith and trust in him as our personal savior, for as Jesus himself told us, he is the only way to you. No man comes to you except through him because he is the way, the only way. So we give thanks for that. We give thanks also for the many things that you do for us. Uh, sometimes it's, it's things we don't even recognize or realize until perhaps some, some other time down the road. We thank you for the material blessings, spiritual blessings, uh, even emotional blessings that you give to us. We pray, God, that uh, we'll always be mindful of that. As we look at our prayer sheet tonight, we recognize that there are so many people who have so many different needs. Some are struggling with uh, medical issues. Some are dealing with emotional issues. Some are grieving. And so, God, whatever that need may be, I just pray that you'll meet it according to your will for their lives. Lord, I also pray for us tonight, those of us gathered in this room, those that are tuned in uh, over, over the uh, Facebook page. God, just meet us where we are and use what Pastor Keith has to say tonight through your Holy Spirit to meet us at our point of need, to encourage us, to instruct us, to strengthen us, whatever our need may be. God, I pray that you might meet that. And Father, in the process of all of this, in the midst of all that may be said, may we experience your presence. And may we firm our commitment to you to be the people you have called us to be. For this we pray. In the sweet and strong name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so if you were here last week, we started in Exodus chapter 32. How many verses do we do? How did I know that y'all would all remember that? Oh, yeah. One verse. Guess how many we're going to do tonight? One more verse. No, no. I'm going to try to get to the end of the chapter, but no guarantees. So, <clears throat> before we jump in, Exodus chapter 32, uh, the second verse. We're studying through Exodus. We're looking for the shadows of the New Testament in this Old Testament um, story. We also, I hope, are recognizing that sinful humanity has really not changed in all these years, all these generations, uh, since the Garden of Eden. Sin has stained all of us. And we all struggle and have for centuries in the same ways in our relationship with God. <clears throat> so there's some really big overarching themes that we could apply to our Christian life. That's, that's the real challenge of studying an Old Testament story is not to study it just for the historicity of it, but to study it for the application of it to where, I'm, where am I today? What is this, where do I see myself? How does this relate to what I'm experiencing in my, in my walk with Christ? And when we get to the end of Exodus, one of these days, we're going to really just kind of take a whole night and look at those big themes and, and what they mean for us. But for now, we're still kind of right here uh, in the middle of the forest, not quite time to step out and look at all the different kind of trees. So Exodus chapter 32, verse 2, after all that about uh, that we looked at last week, <clears throat> so, many, so much stuff in that first verse about the people's reaction to Moses being gone. Uh, so Aaron responds to them because he's the one that was left 
to take names. He, you know, how many of you remember that from school? Anybody remember that phrase, take names? I don't know if they even do that in elementary school anymore. It used to be take names. And um, that was usually the most hated person in the class. So Aaron said to them, uh, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. I mentioned this last week real, real quickly. just want to park on it for just a second. Um, you know, it, it would be a good question to ask if you were studying Scripture. Well, how do these so recent slaves come into possession of all this gold? And we know they carried a, a lot of loot with them, a lot of bounty when they came out. God instructed them. And the Egyptians actually weren't, they were willingly giving these precious things because they just wanted these Israelites gone. They All, all that they'd been suffering through, they, they knew it was a result of uh, the Israelites. And so they'd come out with a lot of gold, but they quickly appropriated these trinkets and became a part of themselves. And they're wearing them, and they got them on, they're, dre- they're playing dress up. Playing dress up, that's what we do. Have you, have you ever read any of the articles about the number of people that have won the lottery and two years later they're broke? Have you read those stories? They win that lottery and then they can't, they don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to handle that wealth. You know, the wise person would give it all to their church. <laughs> how come some of y'all aren't laughing at that? Xandra, what did you do with yours? Um, they just don't know how to handle it. And so they're ridiculous and, and they just appropriate it for themselves and and, uh, you know, when, 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 I guess when you've been living on a, on a pretty tight budget for years and years, and suddenly you win, even if it's a million dollars or two million dollars, to, to you at that time, that's like, golly, I can never spend this much money. And then a couple of years later, they're broke. They've given it away. They've bought. They, you know, they've got five cars and four houses and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, these, these I mean, They've been slaves for years, and now they got all this stuff, and they're, they're wearing it. It's a part of them, but they had no idea. They just really didn't have an idea of God's bigger purpose for all that bounty that they brought out of Egypt. Because they have yet to hear God's invitation for them to bring their gold, because we're going to build a tabernacle. We're going to build an ark, and, and we're going to make all these beautiful things of worship that have to do with who I am. They don't even think about that. And, and so we have to ask ourselves the question. I have to ask myself the question, and... And I'm suggesting you ask yourself the same question. Could it be that there are times when we take the blessings of God and we appropriate them for ourselves without really considering what greater purpose God might have in blessing me with these blessings? It's kind of... It's part of that, that, that human nature we have. We, we hoard, we, we bring to ourselves, we give to ourselves. you know. Of course, we think about money a lot of times. Um, um, you know, obviously, God, God, in our bringing to him his tithe, he's, he's trying to keep us connected with the greater purpose there. Trust me with this, trust me with this, as an expression of your worship of me. And... and um, <coughs> And yet oftentimes, I, I, you know, I counsel with a lot of people about, about that particular area. And, you know, the thing we, they talk about a lot is, you know, I owe so many people so much money. I, we don't have enough. We can't tie the tent. We can't give 10%. If I do that, then I'm going to be behind on my bills, you know. And so you have to work out, okay, well, okay, let's work at getting these bills paid off and not getting any more to add to it. And then and, and they're like, yeah, but, you know, my master card's like got $23,000 uh, um, a balance on it. And I'm, I'm like... You better pray for a miracle because it'll take forever to pay off, you know. But God can do that kind of stuff when you make that commitment. But, man, we just appropriate stuff to ourselves. I think about our talents. You know, it's amazing to me sometimes with Christian people, God's given us some incredible talents. I'm not talking about spiritual gifts. I'm just talking about talents, you know, human talents. And we all have different ones. Uh, Some of them are are quieter. Some of them are more visible. But I've got some good friends, a husband and wife down in uh, Brunswick. Uh, uh, live in Brunswick, Georgia, and um, <clears throat> they're a little bit younger than, than than I am, but I've known them for a lot of years. Matter of fact, she was the oncology nurse for my dad uh, in his last stages of his battle with cancer. So that's kind of how we got to know them, and they've been good friends ever since. But they're both musicians, 
Uh, he's a bass player. She's a guitar player. She has a beautiful voice. She's got a good voice, too. And um, they play around Brunswick for years. They've played in the Brunswick area and, and surrounding areas with four different bands. Four different bands. So every weekend, almost every weekend, they'll be playing at some gig on a Thursday and, and then a Friday night and then a Saturday night. And for years, I used to get after and I said, y'all, have you ever thought about using those talents for worship? You know, in, in your church? No, we, hey, Dave, we're so tired by the time Saturday night's over. We, 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 I said, ah, you, you're looking at this wrong. Maybe you need to, to cut down on the number of gigs you're doing on Thursday and Friday and Saturday and make yourself available to your church. By the way, they go to First Baptist Church in Brunswick. And bring that talent as an offering and use it in worship right there. And this went back and forth for years and years. And every now and then they'd get kind of testy with me. You know, thought I was being a little bit too personal. And I said, well, you know, truth hurts. That truth hurts. And But you know what they're doing now? That's right. They're on the praise and worship team there at Brunswick First Baptist Church. And so there's my friend Dan. And uh, I've seen him in different venues, you know, playing his bass guitar. And he is the typical bass guitar player. He's got the whole, you know, the whole shtick going on. And, and, and then you see him up there on Sunday morning, and he looks like a different man. He doesn't have his little black top hat on and he doesn't you know doesn't have he's just up there and 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 but standing the same way to playing guitar but it's just really kind of neat but they had never really thought when i first brought that up they said well you know we never thought about that i'm like yeah i know because you're not going to make any money on sunday morning but you'll be rich because of it you bring it to the lord we 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 take blessings we take the talents that god has given us we we appropriate those for ourselves, you know, whether it's our people skills. You know, I've, I've, I've seen people who are just so good at it. Not everybody's a good conversationalist. Have you ever noticed that before? I mean, not everybody is. Uh, I, I, can, I can talk to a wall and thoroughly enjoy the conversation. I can. There have been, there have been many times I've, I've, I've really almost brought a wall to salvation in Christ. Just, you know, and talking with it. It, it just happens. But... But not everybody's that way. Some people are quieter, but, you know, it's interesting. People who are such good conversationalists, and you say something to them, and this has happened two or three times in my years of ministry, I say, hey, would you, would you consider being a greeter on Sunday morning just to talk with people? And they go, oh, no, I couldn't do that. I say, well, what do you mean you can do that? You'll, you'll talk to animals. You'll talk to inanimate objects. What, what do you mean? You I, I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> what? You know, every other time in life what to say. You just be yourself. You say, hey, Laura, how you doing? It's good to see you here today. You just talk. Ah, you know, we use these things for ourselves. So it's a challenge for us to, to kind of see what had happened here. And they're taking all this stuff, and they're wearing it, and it was there. So verse 3, all the people, they took off the rings of gold that were in their ears, and they brought them there. Okay, and I want you to catch the irony, if we can call it irony, the spiritual irony of this is that they brought as an offering something that God was going to ask them to bring as an offering. You remember that? That's what, he's, that's what he's been telling Moses up there on that mountaintop. They haven't heard that part yet. And so down here, while, while Moses up here getting these spiritual instructions that would honor and glorify God, these people down here under Aaron's leadership are taking the same gold and bringing it as an offering, but it has nothing to do with God. It's got to do with their own personal desires, what they want to experience right there. Because they had asked for a God to lead them, something they could see. And we talked about that from verse 1. So he received the gold from their hand. He fashioned it with a graving tool. He made a golden calf. And they said, this is how the people responded to this calf that Aaron fashioned out of the gold. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out out of the land of Egypt. They were giving this golden calf credit for what God has just done. The glory of God in this moment was traded for the likeness of a cow. But you know, anytime we choose to elevate something as an idol in our life to pursue something with greater passion than we're pursuing God 
We're always trading down. Always. And here again, one of those questions we have to ask, okay, maybe we don't have a golden calf sitting in our house, but what, 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 what do we give our time and our passion and our energy to? What, what things other than God are we willing to make sacrifices for in the moment, whatever it might be? And we've got to be careful about that. Their idols are still around today. Somebody give me an example of one. Let me see if you're cluing in here. What's, what's a modern-day idol that we have? Money. What would you say? Money. Money. Facebook. Hmm? Okay, let's just say the smartphone <laughs> and all that you can access through the smartphone. I want to tell you, you look around you sometimes. There's a lot of bowing before the smartphone. That's really the only way you can deal with it, is you've got to bow before it. Gail's not in here. Yeah, I get on my wife all the time. I say, I say Gail, get, get off the phone. I, I was just looking. At, I know, you, I know, I can see you were just looking. Get off the phone. I'm going to have to have that finger amputated. You're going to wear that joint out. Get off the phone. Okay, what's another one? Hmm? Time. Time. It becomes our idol when we decide we want to do everything with our time according to our purposes, our desires. One more. Children. Who said that? <laughs> Can we add grandchildren to that? <laughs> our children, our grandchildren. We've got to be careful to keep them in the right perspective. We've got to be careful to keep our spouse in the right perspective. If you put your spouse ahead of your passion for God, you've, you've made of your spouse an idol. And now you're never going to, in that, in, that, in, that, in that arrangement, you're never going to be able to be the kind of spiritual spouse that God's called you to be because everything's out of order. You've got to get that back in order. So verse 5. So when Aaron saw this, now what did he see? He saw the people... Excited, happy, yes, look, this is our God. This, this is who we're going to give credit to. This is, this is what I'm talking about. This is how you do this. I'm going back to last week again. Remember, these Israelites for 400 years have been in the midst of pagan idolatry. The cow, by the way, the cow was the idol of choice. It was the most, the, uh, the most used um, thing among uh, idol makers both in Egypt and also among uh, the Philistines who were the occupants of the promised land that they're on their way to. Isn't it amazing that the cow came out of their gold as well? Why? Because, that, that, hey, everybody's got a cow, a golden one. Now we got our own. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before. And I, I, I can't speak for Aaron, but I'm thinking that in this moment, and we're going to see something else about his character in just a minute. But I'm thinking in this moment, he, he kind of went on a bit of an ego trip. You know what I'm talking about? A little bit of a, oh, okay, people are liking me now. Look at that. They are a rare in the go. Let me follow after them. There was a guy named King Saul who made the same mistake one time. And he tried, he tried to excuse himself by saying, well, I, I listened to the people around me, and this is what they wanted. And I thought I better go ahead and do it. But for whatever reason, he saw this, he built an altar before it, and he made a proclamation. He said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord, using the same name that had been used in reference to God. Now he's referring to this calf by the same name, Yahweh. So they rose up early the next day. They offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and <clears throat> It was not just water they were drinking. And then they rose up to play. We're not talking about cornhole or pickleball. They were imitating what they had seen at all the pagan festivals for all the generations that had been in slavery. The behavior, the revelry, the drunkenness. There was some immorality, I promise you. There was some immorality going on in this moment. 
the people of God who have been brought out of slavery by his incredible supernatural power. Moses has been up there for how many days? Two weeks, three weeks. Haven't been 40 days yet because he's not back down. And suddenly they've gone from the supernatural God to a cow, but they're using the same name. They are eating, drinking, and they are playing. Uh, <clears throat> one guy I was reading just on some of the commentaries, he made this interesting comment. He said, look, if you mix idolatry with Christianity, you no longer have Christianity. There is no syncretism whereby we can take our Christian faith and then, then bring into that matrix other faiths or beliefs and still call it Christianity. Christianity is an exclusive relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no additional belief from, from this school of thought or from this religion or from this cult that we can bring in there and add to that. I know of, I know of so-called ev evan evangelical churches where they have taken the Christian gospel, the biblical gospel, of all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God the eternal life in Jesus Christ. Okay? They've taken that, but they have brought in from these other places additional beliefs like there are several ways to get to the top of the mountain. Jesus is one of them, but there are others. The thing is, in the end, that we all end up in the same place. Okay, as soon as you do something like that, it's no longer Christianity. Okay, now it's, it, it's some kind of really weird, odd nothingness that comes in there. You just can't do it. Verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, here we go. The Lord knows what's going on from up there on his uh, perch on the mountaintop. Moses, go down for... Uh, isn't this interesting right here? What does it say in your scripture? Go down. <laughs> God's already washing his hand. He said, Moses, you need to go down. Your people are messing up. This is some of your gene pool. This ain't got nothing to do with me. <laughs> your people, whom you <laughs> brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly, and we've talked about that, how quickly we forget what God has done we look at our current situation and we struggle to believe that God is going to be at work in this situation, maybe like he has, or we forget and we look to things other than God for our salvation, for our redemption, for our protection, whatever it is. They've turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf. They have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone go, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. This is such an interesting verse right here. Basically, in, in, in simple language, God is saying, go, I'm going to destroy these Israelites, and then I'm going to rebuild the whole nation out of you. Okay, what was the promise? What was the promise made to Abraham? That he would make from Abraham and his seed a great nation. That was the promise. I, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what, that maybe it was the one thing that sustained to some degree the nation of Israel when, when and while they were in the slavery portion of their occupancy in Egypt is, is this whole story. God has made a promise. God has made a promise. God has made a promise. And, and, and now he says, no, okay. Um, my wrath's going to burn hot against them. I'll consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Now, I'm just going to throw this in right here. And maybe more so in this current era that we live in, this current culture. But I I, I, I know a lot of people who would have jumped at this opportunity. This would have been a promotion for Moses. In, in, effect, in effect, God's saying that there'll come a day when, 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 when my people, they'll not, trace, they'll not trace their ancestry back to Abraham. 
They will trace it back to who? To you. You will be the father of many nations. You will be the one revered. You will be the one spoken of in whispers and with great awe. Moses, our ancestor, the one that God raised up and from him established a great name. I can see a lot of people falling for that. Influence. Standing. That's big. That's big. Oh, we see a lot about Moses' character. We talked about Aaron's. Look at Moses. But Moses implored the Lord his God. And he said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power, with a mighty hand? He, he immediately, he didn't even, he doesn't even stop and see, God, what are you offering me here? He didn't want any part of that. He goes right into intercessory prayer on behalf of this people that God has called him to lead out of Egypt. And he starts praying for these rebellious Israelites. And he doesn't even know the extent of their rebellion. He's still up there with God right now. But the first thing he does is he starts praying for these people. And, and, and he doesn't start pleading based on their worthiness. He starts pleading based on the character of God. You see, this is a big thing. Now, listen to me. When we start praying to God and, and when it's a difficult situation in our life or somebody else's life or in the life of our church, our country, our nation, whatever it is, we need to always approach prayer from the place of the character of God and what he says about himself in Scripture and how he works in Scripture as opposed to approaching God with whatever our intercessory concerns are from the standpoint of God. Um, uh, I want you to do this, God. This person or these people deserve your blessing, your protection, your deliverance, whatever it is. Because the truth is, if you're going to plead your case before God based on your standing, what, what, do you, what is there to convince God? But would you want to have to talk God into why you're deserving of his blessing, his deliverance, his protection, his mercy. I don't want to have to, if all I've got to stand on is my record, it's not there. Moses jumps right in. He doesn't, he doesn't say, man, dude, God, listen, they're messing, they're messing up. They are messed up, and they're messing up. But these are some great people, God. They got good hearts. They just don't know any better. They're just doing what they've seen going on in Egypt for the last 400 years. God, you know, take it easy. He doesn't do that. He says, God, look what you've already done in the lives of these people. Look what you've already invested based on who you are in fulfillment of your promises. He goes on in verse 12. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out? Meaning, did God bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger. Relent from this disaster of your people. He, he, he's like, God, I, I, I don't want people, I don't want people to say things about you that are not true and true to your character. They're not under, God, what are people going to think? And then he goes back to the promise. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self. See how he's appealing to the character of God here? Not a, we're worthy, but a, God, you're worthy. I just want, I just want to come at you from that angle, from, from, from that truth. That's all I have to stand on is your character. You swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented. You're talking about some powerful prayer on the part of the leadership of a group of people of God. You're seeing it right here. It, it wasn't, God, look, would you just, man, would you just bless our church and, 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 and make us bigger? And, and, and No, no, it was God. Would you, we, we, we just, my desire is that in, in, in accordance with your character and your, your promises in Scripture, God, we just bring this before and we trust you. To, to work in this in a way that's consistent with who you are and what you tell us about yourself in Scripture. God relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing to his people. So uh, just I, I'm going to go through this really, really fast. 
although we could spend the rest of our night tonight right here in verse 14. Because this is one of those times in Scripture when we see God speaking one thing, and then as a result of this passionate prayer of Moses on behalf of the people of God, he relents. He relents. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, okay, God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. And he does. Uh, we read in the New Testament and we sing in one of the great old hymns of the faith, and it comes to God, there is no shadow of turning in you. You're, you know, you're always true north. You think about the sundial. You know, it's, it's just there is no shadow of turning in you. you. You are not changed by changing circumstances around you. But God also declares in Scripture, now listen to this. He also declares in Scripture that he may choose to relent and not bring spoken or threatened judgment upon a people should they change their way. Okay, now here, listen to me, here is one of those shadows of the new and the old. Stop and think about it for a minute. God has already pronounced on all sinners condemnation. Yes? Hasn't he? He's already pronounced that. That's, that's the judgment against the sin of humanity. Against all individual sinners. Condemnation. Eternal punishment. Separation from God. That's already been announced. Yet. Yet. In Christ. He says, if you change your heart toward me, if you come to me and receive the salvation I offer you, then for you I will relent on condemnation. Place that on Christ and receive you to myself. This is God. You were born under condemnation. That has changed in your relationship with God through Christ. And he says in, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 18:8, 8, if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I intended to do it. Again, in 26.3 of Jeremiah, it may be they will listen and everyone turn from his evil way that I may relent of the disaster that I intended to do to them because of their evil deeds. In other words, he might relent if the people repent or as here in response to this intercessory prayer. What's the point I want to make about that? Is this. When we're praying for lost people, God loves that prayer. When we bow down before him to intercede and to supplicate for those that we know have not received Christ as their Savior, to those that we know stand under the condemnation of sin and the punishment of sin, man, God hears those prayers. God, God just responds. He responds in the way that his Holy Spirit works in the life of the one who has yet to receive his son, Jesus Christ, and begins that incredible process of fresh and anew and, 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 and vigorously to reach into and to prepare and to draw that person to the point of surrendering before and receiving Christ. Man, you can have confidence when you're praying for the salvation of a lost person because that's right at the heart of who God is. It's right there at the heart of it. Moses, what a beautiful example. And see, the other thing we've got to understand is that God is a relational God. God, God. God likes relationship. He's called you into a relationship. He calls us into a relationship with himself through Christ. Garden of Eden, he had a relationship with Adam and Eve until sin came in. And then that relationship was fractured. And, and so now he's teaching them what that relationship is going to look like. And that's what all this Old Testament is about. And there's so many shadows of the New Testament in here because it's coming to a point in what we call the New Testament where God then, through the sacrifice of his own son for our sin, says... We can have a full, deep, rich, intimate, life-changing, supernatural relationship that will answer every desire of your heart, but only through Christ. Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There it is. God's relational. You know? And it's not that Moses was telling God anything he didn't already know, but he, he, he just... He appealed to God based on what he knew about the glory of God's name and his faithfulness to his promises. It's a beautiful thing. But even though he relented, 
from destroying them, obliterating them. He, he did hold them accountable for their wickedness. And we'll see that in just a minute. Verse 15, Moses turned. He went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. In his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, okay, front and back, they were written. Those tablets were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. How, how big do you think those things were? Okay, I'm with you on that. That's a good estimation. You know, I think about him coming down from the mountain toting those things. And, of course, he's going to do something with them here in a second. But it's amazing, these tablets. Verse 17. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. This is, this is one of those little things that is, I, I just want to throw it out there. All this time that Moses has been up there on the, on the top in the presence of God, you know who was just below the summit waiting for him? Joshua. Waiting. Who, who would be the one who actually led or leads the Israelites into the promised land? Joshua. What, what, a, what a beautiful picture of patience and of trust and of waiting. All this stuff, all that stuff going up on top of the mountain. Presence of God. And he's probably just down here sheltered in the rocks. Just waiting. And he's right here. And, and Moses comes down and they meet up. And he's like, man, it sounds like, <laughs> this will tell you what kind of playing was going on. There, it sounds like war in the camp. Verse 18, but he says, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. Revelry. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. You ever done something out of anger that you regretted later? Anybody in here? Or am I the only one? And isn't it interesting now? Faced with the wrath of God, Moses was very humble. He said, God, God. Now, as Moses faced fully the rebellion of the people, what took over Moses' heart? I mean, he was just so frustrated and angry at, at what was going on. And he threw those tablets down and they broke. I don't know if he ever says anything to anybody like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. But he did. He took the calf that they had made and he burned it with fire. He ground it to powder. He scattered it on the water and he made the people of Israel drink it. Wow. So I'm thinking, what happens to somebody if you drink water that has gold dust in it? And you know what? It's actually good for you. No, it really is. It, especially if it's a high-quality gold, you know. But I, I did not know. How I many of you knew that? Water with gold or silver or even copper in it has some incredible value to the human body and, 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 and all this stuff. And I'm like, I was expecting it to say, you know, you choke and die or, or, you know, you turn green for a while like cheap gold jewelry, you know, how it turns your finger green or whatever it is. There's actually some value to it. There are products out there. Gold-infused water, silver-infused water. And I'm like, wow, who knew? Okay, so that's not the reason God said drink the water. It wasn't as punishment because it wasn't going to hurt them. Unless it was really bad gold, and we don't really know. I, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Moses was making a point. He said, "Really? You, you, you're, you're going to call this calf by the same name as the the great I am? 
Let, let, me, let me show you. Let me show you what this idol is really all about. And he, and he grounds it to powder, throws it on the water. There's your God. Drink up. Drink up. There's your God. Ah. And, and it, is, it says to Aaron, and here's where we need to really realize that we really are kissing first cousins with uh, the Israelites. So Moses turns to Aaron. What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, you're right, Moses. I really messed up. I own this. I can't blame it on them. Nah. Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people. They're set on evil. <laughs> Adam, did you eat? Did you eat of that fruit of that tree? No, but that woman you gave me, <laughs> she gave it to me. She didn't tell me what it was, and I ate it. We've been playing this game with God and with each other for thousands of years. We have a hard time with that whole thing that we're told in the first chapter of John that if we can confess our sin, that, that is, sometimes we, we quote that verse so much, I think we forget the stark nakedness that that verse calls for. We have to own our sin before God. It's not my mama's fault. It's not my daddy's fault. It's not my third grade teacher's fault. I have sinned. I have sinned before God. There's that great story uh, as Jesus is watching that we see in Scripture. And there, he tells about two men praying, one who had everything and one who was a hated tax collector. And they offered two prayers before God. The one was full of all kind of flowery words. And a part of that was, God, I am so glad I'm not like this sorry dude right here. And yet that tax collector, what was his prayer? Yeah. God, by your mercy, be merciful. For I'm a sinner. I mean, it's hard. That's hard. Saying I am wrong is hard. Anybody in here besides me struggle with those words? It's just, I, if I'm the only person in the club, then we need to scoot on to something else. Anybody in here struggle saying I'm wrong? Did, does anybody struggle in here saying it before you've been caught, or do you have to be caught before you'll say it? That... That's a real sign of maturity, by the way, when you know you've done wrong in some form or fashion, and you go, one, to God, and then to a, a person or people if, if that's involved, and you confess that before you're caught. Every, every time I'm doing uh, marriage counseling, post-marriage counseling, and there's been infidelity or whatever involved, I'll look at the offending party, and I'll say, I want to ask you this. Would you still be doing this if you hadn't been caught? Are you sorry? Are you, are you repentant? Because you see the sin of what you've been doing? Or are you just mad because you got caught? And you've got to go through this process to hopefully work it out with your spouse. There's a big difference there. So, let not the Lord be. You know the people that are set on evil. Because look, they said to him, they said, Make us gods who shall go before us. This is verse 23. As, as for this Moses... The man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't even know what has become of him. He's just quoting what they had said all the way back to verse 1. And so I said to them, I just had this idea. Okay, if you have any gold, take it off. And they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire. And out came a calf. <laughs> the funny thing is we read, if you were paying attention, which I'm sure all of you were because none of you are sleepy, a little bit earlier, we read that Aaron crafted that calf. Ah, memories get fuzzy, though, don't they? Yeah. Dang, I don't know. I saw him with the guy who was at First Baptist St. Mary. He had, he had been unfaithful to his, to his wife. And um, he had come to me for some counseling. We were talking, I said, dude, what, what were you thinking? 
I don't know. He said, he said, Pastor Keith, I don't know. It's just like, you know, one minute everything is all right, and the next minute we were in bed together. Which fits right in with, I don't know. Put gold in there and a cow popped down. I don't know. One minute we're just talking, the next my pants are off. I don't know how that happened. We have such a hard time being honest with God and with each other. When Moses saw that the people had broken loose for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies. Let me stop and say one thing about Aaron. We see Aaron, there was not a lot of character in him. He had some, I'm sure. He'd been through a lot with Moses. But, you know, you can tell a lot about somebody's character when they're under pressure. You can tell a lot about what really makes somebody tick when the pressure's on. Do they stick to their guns? Do they stick to what is right? Do they do the right thing, whether it's popular or not, whether they keep their job or not, whether they keep their friends or not, whether they make people happy or not, whether they're liked or not, this is the right thing, we're going to stick with it. And, and Aaron, man, in this instant, he really, we, he, there's a lot of things revealed about him. He, he was a people pleaser. He wanted everybody to be happy with him. And he had a hard time owning up to his sin. Well, everybody, it's all broken loose. There's a, there's a party going on. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp, and he said, Who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. That's a very disturbing passage right there. Isn't it? And it kind of offends our sensibilities a little bit. You know, our 2023 civilized way of looking at life. My friends, what, you, what you're seeing right here it's God's judgment against sin. This was played out on a much grander scale, a much more horrific scale on Calvary. When God allowed his son to be crucified for your sin and mine. Sin is no joke. It brings death. I mean, it does. Sometimes it it will result maybe in untimely physical death, but if one does not receive God's grace through Jesus Christ, sin will always result in that second death, eternal separation, eternal judgment, and the lake of fire. Sin is no joke. And so we're going to stop right there because it's time to stop. And we we're 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 almost got all the way through the chapter. We're not too well. Yeah, almost. And we'll pick it back up. I want to encourage you, okay? I'm going to make a really big, broad application here. Can I do that? I think partly because we live under grace. We're in, we're in the time of grace, the church age. And grace is an incredible thing. Do you agree? The Bible tells us what? That where sin abounds, what abounds even more? Grace. But we've got to be careful about how we teach grace, okay? Because one of the errors, I think a biblical error, in our understanding and application of what grace is all about and the grace we live in is this idea that, okay, if I'm going to love you with the love of Christ and I have to accept the sin in your life and not say anything about it, that's not grace. That's not even Christianity. When you came to Christ, for the salvation of your soul, God began then a work in your life. And if you've been growing in Christ, you would have to say tonight that God has piece by piece, room by room, stick by stick, been rebuilding your heart, taking out the old, taking out the sin, taking out the thoughts, taking out the habits, and replacing them with things that bring him glory. Am I right or wrong? How many of you have been changing all the way through this journey? Yeah? He does. And so when you're out here in the marketplace and you're talking to somebody about the love of God, and they'll say, okay, you, you say you love me because God loves me, but let me ask you this. Are you going to accept my lifestyle? 
Well, if that lifestyle they're referring to is contrary to the Word of God, you do not look at that person and say, oh, absolutely, don't worry about that. No, no, you say, you know what? I'm going to let God deal with that in your life, but I want you to know that God loves you and I love you too. You, you, you cannot put God's blessing on something that God has not blessed. You understand what I'm saying? It's a real challenge. Let me tell you what's going to happen. A lot of people, and I've run into this, when you say, no, I can't, I can't agree with your lifestyle because it's contrary to everything God teaches. But I'm going to let God, by his Holy Spirit, work in you. But you, the first step is accepting his son, Jesus Christ, to recognize that he died for you and for this world. And I've had people look right back at me and say, let, let me tell you something. You cannot tell me that you love me if you are not willing to agree with my sinful lifestyle. And I've had to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I disagree there. I disagree. And I'll even tell them, I said, I've, I've had to tell my children before, I love you with all my heart, but I do not agree with what you're doing with your life right now. Sometimes when we speak the truth, that is the greatest expression of love that we can offer somebody. Not speaking truth in condemnation, not speaking truth in judgment, speaking truth to the glory of God. This is what the Bible teaches Anyway, there's a thought. Let's stand together and pray. We dismissed. Father God, we love you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to, to walk through your word and all the different ways it applies to us. And I pray by your Holy Spirit, you give us the insight that by your Holy Spirit, you apply into our hearts what we need to know, understand, hear, and respond to. Father, I, I pray that even as we swim in this bottomless ocean of grace that we are always mindful that you are never approving of our sin. Teach us to walk in that, that fine balance, to pursue holiness in all that we do for your glory. Bless every home represented here tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>